beautiful grave it is. Because <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> I'm really not. <coughs> you know what came to my mind last night? I had five years of vaccinations for allergies. transplanted and knocked out all my other immunizations, mm. it might have taken away those. Mm. So I started taking a sickly day, a little tiny allergy pill, to see if it helps. I like this. It'll be fine.
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bethel. We're so excited that you're here today. Why don't we go ahead and stand and let's worship the Lord.
His favor rests upon the lonely. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made, who made a shepherd boy courageous. Cause I may not face the light. Standing on your faithfulness, your faithfulness. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God.
presence of God and I uh, and I was like wow I just wanted to sit there a little longer linger a little longer welcome welcome to Bethel Church we're glad you're here and we're glad you're here online listening and watching and being with us uh, maybe one day you can come on down and visit in person it'll be great in the meantime we just wanted to share with you that if you are new we have visitor cards that we'd like you to welcome cards that we'd like you to fill out that helps us to be able to uh, reach out to you in 
pray for you in any way you, you have needs and as well as letting you know what's going on in the different uh, services we have coming up. Um, for those who don't know, or just as a, a matter of information, the kids are downstairs, the bathrooms are downstairs, we have coffee and refreshments uh, downstairs as well, and uh, we have Guest Central right around the corner for anything you might need. Um, anyone who's wearing a, uh, a yellow uh, band around their necks uh, are working with kids, and anyone with green are guest services. We've got some exciting services coming up. We so enjoyed last week, did we not? Was that not a great dinner last week? That was awesome. We just want to thank you so, so much for a terrific dinner and a great time together and a great time of fellowship. Well, we've got some other great times coming up as well. We do have, uh, this is Holy Week, so we have Good Friday coming up at 6 o'clock. It will be right here in the sanctuary. It will be a communion service, a one-hour service, so we just invite you to come out. And then next Sunday is Easter. This is Palm Sunday. Welcome. Happy Palm Sunday. We have our palms in the back. Um, mm -hmm. But um, we are having... Uh, Easter next week, Resurrection Sunday, some people call it. Um, and uh, we have, for the children, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt as a part of um, after the teaching. And um, so uh, we'll have some goodie bags for you to, uh, to come home with. Um, in the meantime, uh, we just want to let you know, too, that we do have a, a mo special Mother's Day coming up in May. Um, just giving you a little preview ahead. It's a special service, and if you have a, your mother living who can, is able to come, please invite them. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to invite Don to come up. Praise the Lord. I'd like to read Psalm 96, verses 1 through 10. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, all ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved he shall judge the people righteously. Verse 8 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. You know, there are a lot of statements in the Bible that are, are so simply put. They're easy to understand. They're simply put. The language behind it, either in the Greek or in the Hebrew, is very simple nothing very complicated. It's sort of like the commandment to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. It's very simple. But the moment that you start to even consider it, you realize how profound that very simple statement is. So easy, it comes out of our lips very, very quickly and easily. And yet then when you start to consider it, it <laughs> It's like, whoa. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. I was looking at some commentaries and they come at them and they say, that's impossible. Because we can't give unto the Lord all that is due his name. He is so great, so awesome, so powerful so worthy that it will take all of eternity, all of us, all of eternity, all of creation for all of eternity to declare his glories. And even then, it's just scratched the surface. But it says, bring an offering and come unto his courts. Hallelujah. So we have time now in bringing our offering unto the Lord. 
There's different ways of giving. You can give digitally. MyBethelChurch.org slash give. You can text to give to 84321. Or you can, if you're here, you can fill out an envelope. And if you are uh, giving and fulfilling your faith pledge concerning the sanctuary uh, renovations, then just make a note of that so that the accounting uh, can be there and then we can uh, recognize it in the right place. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you have any need of assistance, the ushers are here to give you pens or envelopes or even a connect card or other things, Lord. Lord, we thank you. Uh, how do we begin to give honor to you? How do we begin? It's sort of like when a little baby learns how to say mama and dada. <laughs> we stutter to even begin to express all that you are worthy of. And not just bringing the fruit of our lips in praise and acknowledgement, but also we bring our tithes and offerings, finances, but also our own hearts, our own lives. Lord, we give ourselves unto you. We don't just give money and stick it in the plate. It is our very lives that we offer unto you as well, our praise, our honor, our respect, our thanksgiving unto you, Father. We say, Father, receive our tithes and our offerings. In the name of Jesus, amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand? We're going to worship the Lord. We 
believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back. He's coming back again. Lord. Good morning, church. Come on. Somebody give Jesus a shout this morning. Come on. He's good, isn't he? Amen. Thank you, Lord. We believe, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, somebody sh shout hallelujah just before you take a seat. Come on now. Amen. One more time. That gets me excited. Come on now. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. Come on. Come on now. Here at Bethel, we believe church is a celebration and not a funeral. Amen. Come on now. <laughs> Somebody's like, I'm glad you said it, Pastor. I, we do. We do. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of God this morning. And uh, I, I am seeing a couple of faces who are here today who haven't had a chance to see the, the new setup we have in the sanctuary with the new chairs. So again, I just want to say thank you. A big shout out to those of you who served and helped us. I really have to tell you, I am blown away that we were able to get that done in one week. You know, one Sunday we came. We were one way, and another Sunday we came. Could you turn off the monitors for me, Josh? Auxiliary one on the lapel channel, thank you. And I don't need any more volume. And if they're on live stream, we don't have to prioritize that. In person was an option as well. So auxiliary three, you can turn down a little bit as well, just a hair, and that'd be great. So sorry about that. Um, but from one week, over, over one week, just a big change, just really great. And so, so many of you helped serve in that way, and so we're just thankful for you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we're seeing the funding come in for it as well. I think we're around 60% has already come in. We, we faith pledged it. We said we're going to believe God to rock in our life. One of us, those who, who pledged in faith. Uh, that we, what we said was, hey, outside of my regular giving, I'm going to believe this year that God is going to put in my hands this amount for this project. And we're seeing people respond, not only respond in faith, but seeing people who are seeing the Lord do that in their life. And so... Give God a round of applause for that and those who serve. So thank you again. Um, but I just wanted to honor that. So thank you again for everybody who helped. So uh, just a couple of things. So uh, one, guest service team. All right. There is a guest service team meeting on Wednesday. This Wednesday, we don't have midweek service. We have Good Friday service, communion service. So I really, really encourage you to come on out to that. I think it's going to be a, a really great service. Um, on Wednesday... The guest service team meeting is going to happen in the evening on Zoom. So if you're on the guest service team, that's just a little public service announcement for that team. We will be sending out an email there. Uh, you're not in trouble. It's just a huddle. <laughs> it's just a team huddle. All right. Uh, it's just a team huddle get together and uh, fresh equipping, which would be really good. Uh, that will be with uh, Mary Ann on Wednesday. Um, and Good Friday service. Come up on Friday. Good Friday service is going to be wonderful. It's going to be from 6 p.m. 7 p.m., a one-hour service, but it's going to be great right here in the evening, so come on out. We're, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, I think I'm going to preach a part two, an overflow message from today's message. Uh, and then Easter Sunday, come on. Woo! Easter. Celebrate Jesus. Come on. We have Easter Sunday, but we have an egg hunt for kids after church as well downstairs um, and kiddos that come are going to get an Easter grab bag. All right, so come on out for that. A great day on Easter here. So, well, today's Palm Sunday. Everybody, wave your palms. <laughs> wave your palms. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, come on, come on. Let's do it. Wave your palms. Now, if somebody would lift up palm branches, right? Now, I don't know what I do. I'd lose. It. <laughs> so it's Palm Sunday. Why is it called Palm Sunday? It's called Palm Sunday because in Matthew. Chapter 21, in Matthew chapter 21, uh, it, it's known as, if you have a Bible, if you read a Bible, or you've ever gone in the Bible, you'll, you'll see this heading at the top of that chapter. And Jesus did not put that heading in there, okay? <laughs> uh, that's in there for our helps, to help us read and learn. And the title of that would say, like, the triumphal entry, 
all right? And the reason it's called that, it's the triumphal entry, is because Jesus, you could say triumphantly, rode into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem. It was a really exciting time. You say, well, what's triumphant about that? That's what kings would do. <laughs> That's what authorities would do. That's what rulers would do. That's what lords would do, is they would ride into Jerusalem, uh, and people would celebrate, the community would celebrate this new, uh, you could say, political power. And well, in, in a way, what Jesus did was a very triumphant uh, thing. Uh, you may not realize this, but scholars say that on the other side of Jerusalem at the real king riding in and there was a different celebration going on it was a political celebration but jesus is riding into jerusalem and people are shouting and celebrating and they're just going wild we can read about it in matthew 21 verses 6 to 11 let me let me just read to you a little bit of it here's what it says so the disciples went and did as jesus commanded them they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes. You see that there. They literally lifted Jesus up and put him up on the donkey. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So those branches they cut down would be palm trees. Okay, They, they would not be uh, you know, an oak tree like you would have in your backyard or the maple leaf. Uh, but they are palm branches. And so they cut these palm branches down and they begin to spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before, those who followed, cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Wow. What does that mean? They're shouting, save us. <laughs> save us. Right? It's like, it's like every four years when there's a political election, help our country. Like this is, the, this is kind of the attitude of what they had. Hosanna, save us, help us, save us. They're shouting out as people, the entire crowd is calling out to them. And the reason it's celebrated as Palm Sunday is for that very reason of the palm branches that were cut down. Now, we could easily call it Hosanna Sunday. We could call it Throw Your Cloak Over a Donkey Sunday. I kind of like that. Anybody else? <laughs> Come on out to Bethel Church on Throw Your Cloak on a Donkey Sunday. <laughs> it's going to be a great day. We're bringing the donkey in. We're going to throw our jackets and our best suit coats over these donkeys. Um, you could call it a lot of things, but, but we call it Palm Sunday because of the significance of the palm branches being cut down and laid out on the road in, in, by way of royalty. How royalty would, would come in and walk and, and, and just, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, I think for the sake of today, I'm going to turn my microphone off and prioritize our in-person people for the audio and so forth. So, um, so they, they, they cut the palm branches and they lay them down and, it's that tr and that's why it's defined as that triumphal entry because Jesus is triumphantly fulfilling prophecy. He's riding into the town and it's just it's great amazing celebration what you may not realize is that those that were shouting hosanna and they were cutting the branches and laying their clothes i mean that's a pretty awesome display right Amen. those same individuals this so you can say this sunday they're shouting so hosanna save us oh yeah the very next sunday they're the ones that shouted crucify the lord jesus yeah. it's the very exact same crowd very same crowd it's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it and so you could say that this moment, when you really look at it, is really a moment of greatness. Somebody say greatness. 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 So with Jesus riding in on a donkey and just being celebrated and everyone shouting, and it's so awesome, you can see this, this, this spectacle of greatness, of, of Jesus being treated like a king, like a leader, like a lord, and he's just coming in. And there's this celebration. It really... You, if you were to look at it and describe it, you'd say, wow, that is really great. That is just covered in greatness. I mean, just, wow, the display and the splendor is really greatness. That's what it looks like. That's what it seems like. That's kind of the view you get, the attitude you get about the entire experience. It's kind of like a, a, a Super Bowl, you know, win celebration or, or a hometown parade, right? And there's this just awesome and this thing's coming through and you're celebrating it. It's just great, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's just awesome. Well, that greatness, you know, we, we, we tend to think like that as well. You know, great. Let me, let me ask you a question. Who is the greatest quarterback of all time? Oh, boom. 
Boom. <laughs> Come on, who's the GOAT? Who's the greatest quarterback? Any, any, any contenders? Tom Brady. Nobody's like, no, no. Nobody would say Brett Favre, even though he can throw a football that would break your fingers just by his catch. I mean, just amazing. <laughs> right, right. We would say Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. Or Brett Favre or Peyton Manning or Joe Montana going back a little further. Right, there's a, there's a whole bunch of quarterbacks. We would say, man, this is the greatest quarterback of all time. And I agree. I think Tom Brady is undisputed right now. Even if you disagree, you're fighting a losing battle. Okay? Just look at the stats. <laughs> that 
for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with his two brothers. Okay. An argument over. They were irritated with his two brothers. They were displeased. They were annoyed. Here's what it says. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great, somebody say great. 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 Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Let him be your servant. Listen, this is precisely what was going on just before the triumphal entry. There was a conversation about greatness. About greatness. And today I want to challenge us and I want to encourage us by covering this concept of greatness and what that really has to do with, and what Jesus really, how Jesus really defines it, and how we need to kind of think of it. But here's what I want us to understand today. In case you have a little, little child, and you have to book it out of here because something comes up, or you're not feeling well, or you get a phone call. Here's what I want you to understand at the end of the day. Out of everything Jesus says, is, this is the, really the bottom line of what he's saying, is this right here. If you want to be great, somebody say, I want to be great. I want to be great. In the kingdom of God, in God's eyes, you must serve. You and I must serve others. Listen, we must be, be people who understand the power of the tower. <coughs> if you want to be great, say, I want to be great. Then you need to understand the power of the tower. You need to understand the power of the tower. The power of the tower. Tell your name, the power of the tower. Today we're in our, I think, third part of our series on there is a power. And today I want to talk to you about how there is a power in the tower. Tell you one more time. There's a power in the tower. Listen, I say towel because of what a towel represents. You know, when you think about a towel, the towel represents really service. Service to others, serving others. Think about a waitress. If you dump a drink, what do they grab? They don't grab a crown. What do they do? They grab a towel, right? When you make a mess, what do you do? Grab a towel, right? When you're coming out of the shower and you're soaking wet, what do you do? Grab a towel, right? Come on. What do you do when you're going to step on the floor and you don't want to step on the floor at the shower and you throw what down the floor? A towel. What do you find a ton of in every hotel? Towel. Towel. Fresh, rolled, clean, amazing, right? And they're so nice. You've ever had that thought like, hmm, I like this towel. Maybe I'll take it home. I'm not saying I did. I'm just saying. <laughs> We've all been there. You've all had that thought. <laughs> or you've all gone that route where you did get home and you realize, oh my gosh, I took home a hotel towel with me. Anybody ever do that before? Maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one who's ever done that. <laughs> Listen, if you want to be great, then you've got to know and understand the power of the towel. Listen, the disciples, that is the, the exact conversation they were wrestling with and having. And that's what the conversation I want to kind of break down for us this morning. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us to learn and know the power of the towel. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so in, in, right here with this argument that's going on, there's a little, there's a lot that's actually happening in there that, that we, we kind of need to key in on or be aware of that's really, really helpful to, to the story. So Jesus, just before the triumphal entry, just before he goes up into Jerusalem, there's this conversation that happens. And it happens as a result of the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And clearly, uh, we, we know that it wasn't the mother of the sons of Zebedee just, you know, in, 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 like basically invoking this conversation or striking this conversation up. Because the other disciples, after the question is asked, the other disciples become irritated with the other two, not with the mom. <laughs> Because how many of you know moms just do what moms do? They have your best in mind, <laughs> right? Most of the time, right? And so, so we know that there's a conversation kind of going on between these two sons and, and that the other disciples hear about that mom gets involved in on. Who are these guys, though? These guys, these two, are known as the sons of thunder. Come on, a little bit of thunder, a little bit of lightning, right? <laughs> right, say sons of thunder. Say just like that. Sons of thunder. Sons of thunder. Right? These are the two brothers. They are known as the sons of thunder uh, because they're referred to as the sons of thunder. They're given this nickname by actually by Jesus himself. 
in uh, over in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Luke 9, 54. Here's what it says. Listen to this. I believe we have it. I believe we have it. We may not have it. If I get a head nod, we don't have it. I know. I'm going to move on. Luke 9, 54. I think I see it on the screen back there. There we go. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? What was going on there? There was a situation that arose, and there was disagreement among the religious towards Jesus and these two brothers, literally their response was this. Lord, do you want us to call fire down and just from heaven just like Elijah did? You know, and Jesus basically tells them to cool their jets. And here, from here, he names them the sons of thunder. Or, or in Greek, it would be like energy, right? And energy coming down from heaven. And so that's where we get the name sons of thunder. And Jesus named them sons of thunder because of that response. They were all bold. And, oh, you disagree with Jesus? I'll call fire down on you. Right? Oh, you mess with Jesus. Oh, we're going to strike you. It's just like, oh, and they're all like thunderous. And like, and so Jesus gives them this nickname. Known as the sons of thunder. These guys who are big and bad and tough. And yeah. You know, you ever go around like, oh, man, I'm going to call thunder down on you. Right? And, and they're referencing back, too, to Elijah when fire came down and just consumed all the false pagan prophets, idolatrous worshipers, and all this stuff that going on in the Old Testament. Fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. Fire actually didn't even come down and consume the pagans, actually. It came down and consumed the sacrifice. And so that kind of shows you what kind of knowing your Bible, but not really knowing it does. <laughs> you call fire down on the wrong people in the wrong place in the wrong way. <laughs> but here they are. They're, they're like zealous. They're excited. Oh, yeah, call fire down. So Jesus calls them that. He names them the nickname Sons of Thunder. Two brothers ready to take on Right, ready to ready to go at it, ready to take on the world, ready to take on anybody who challenges them, right? And, and just oh yeah, give you what you got coming to you, and give you what you got coming to you. Part two, that's like these two brothers, two intense guys. Okay, as awesome as they sound, the story we're in, the sons of my thunders, mom, <laughs> had to be the one to come to ask Jesus the request. So I don't know how big and bad they really were. Because these sons of thunder, their little mom, their mommy comes over, you know, and asks a question. Just picture this, right? Sons of thunder, you're, you're known for calling fire down. You're known for a bull saving, and your, your mommy has to come over, and now your mommy's making the less she could. <laughs> and here's the other disciples quite irritated, right? Because maybe they, didn't, they thought, I don't want to irritate my friends, so I'm going to send them off. You know, Jesus goes into it, and he starts to explain it. And, and, and here's what Jesus is doing. Right away, Jesus has to start correcting thinking. There has to be a change in thinking. Because they were bringing to Jesus, and they were carrying with Jesus, come, even though they were walking with him, a completely wrong thinking, even though they knew Jesus and were walking with Jesus. They were thinking what they thought they knew. And really firmly believed, and were bringing that into their relationship with Jesus. And now we see Jesus quite literally breaking a stronghold and a deceptive lie in their life just through conversation with them and teaching them. Pretty powerful. Pretty, pretty amazing. It's absolutely amazing, to be honest with you. And so Jesus does that. He, the, the kind of thinking that they're dealing with, that, that Jesus was addressing and confronting, was that it was common for people to view and assume and think and look at this idea of greatness uh, through the lens of being like a lord and a king and having authority and, and being one who is the greatest, meaning in their view, and this is why the other disciples were irritated, probably because they were assuming, what, what gives you the right to think that you guys can be the ones that are greater than us? Why wouldn't we be greater than you? Think about the conversation that's happening there. They're essentially asking, hey, I'd like my sons to be the greatest in the kingdom. 
I want them to be in authority and in charge and telling everybody else what to do. And I'd like them to be in a place where they're not having to do all this, but instead others are under them. Because the, and that's kind of how that was going. And then you can reasonably understand why the other disciples would be irritated. Because that is, how do I know that? Because of what Jesus responded to. Jesus didn't give an answer to an irrelevant issue. He's addressing the root issue. He's addressing the real issue going on there, and so he addresses it. What does he address? Jesus immediately addresses it and goes into, hey, listen, everybody come with me. Let's have a quick conversation here. <laughs> Based on the question that was just asked, mom was said to do it. I know about you sons of thunder and what you're thinking, and you other disciples are irritated because you think that somebody's about to get uh, positional authority over you. And Jesus literally reteaches them. And this isn't the only time that Jesus has to correct this kind of thinking and teach them. We, we understand in Matthew, we see it in Mark, but there's a, in, in Matthew and Mark, it's the same place. It's before the triumphal entry. But this conversation actually comes up again, not the same exact message or conversation, but it actually is a, another conversation they had. And Jesus has to address it in Luke. In Luke, you'll find this conversation, which has a different variety and flavor to it, It'll be after the triumphal entry. So Jesus teaches his disciples before the triumphal entry this issue about greatness, and he has to have the conversation again after the triumphal entry, which would tell you this is a common and a very real issue that he has to get them to understand. And what is that? It's that Jesus, he brings them together, and he teaches them, and he, and he says to them, listen, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. And in Luke, when Luke breaks it down, he goes into it and he talks about how those who are, are of great authority and have lordship over people, and they actually call themselves benefactors. Or in the Greek, it means doers of good. Doers of good. And so Jesus says, not so among any of you. Among you, among God's followers, you are to be this instead. And so Jesus is confronting them. What they understood and what they were actually asking and looking for was a broken mindset on what it meant to be great. They were basically looking for, I want to be great. I want to have to not do any of this other dirty stuff. I don't want to be the least. I want to be the greatest. I want to be over. I want to have authority. I want to be viewed at like this. I want to be doing that. And Jesus is confronting them. They're striving for more authority. There's, but doing it through the lens of what culture has constantly taught them from their upbringing, what it looks like to be the greatest of all time. My, and, and I don't say this offensively, but I can tell you when I was younger, NFL, quarterbacks, sports, those people at the top, they, they were like awesome to me. I thought they were the most amazing people in the world until I realized other than a towel on the football field, it's basically the only towel they understood. It's a sad day in society when those of great, great highlights and clips and power and authority and wealth and sports are viewed as the greatest thing to be. But you'll never see an ESPN highlight for the nurse or the doctor. You'll never see it for the counselor. You'll never see it for the therapist. You'll see it for these other things that everybody gives them a ring and celebrates them and pays the, the ticket and wonderful thing. And I'm not saying those are bad people. If you're one of those people in here, awesome. I have something I thought you'd sign after. <laughs> all right, all right. But Jesus is addressing the issue that culture has a way of subjectively teaching us things. Not always objectively, but subjectively. And they learned it and they saw it. They saw lords and leaders. They saw kings and rulers. People who were of great power, great prestige, great authority, actually being elevated and being, being celebrated. And all of this might, and they were looking for that. They wanted that. They wanted the greatness that they saw on display. And that is the very thing that Jesus is addressing. Jesus is teaching them, listen, you've seen it. You know that the lords of the Gentiles, they lord it over. They, they lord it over the people. They, they basically, and what that word lord it over means, it means to place oneself up above and worth or seen and valued. It's quite literally a setting of oneself apart as, I'm of a different class and I'm more than you. And 
and Jesus is addressing that. That's one layer and level that he's addressing. In Luke, when you read the same story, not the same story, but a, a, the, the same issue, but in a different setting, where Jesus is correcting the same kind of thinking, one of the things he highlights there and addresses is how, you know, in, in that then no world, and we would know nothing of this in the 21st modern century, of, of being in a place of authority and power and prestige, but calling it and defining oneself as a benefactor or a doer of good. And the problem there was that Jesus was addressing in the culture of the day that they often experienced were people who were constantly in power and authority and all the time, and, and, and based on the term, they would be doers of good, when really it was a flip-flop. They, they were lording it over the people, and the people were subservient and slaves of the Lord. And that is what Jesus is getting at, because he's saying to them, hey, not so among you. Not so among you. That is the issue that Jesus is addressing. What he is addressing is to be great, to be great, we must serve others. Jesus said, if you want to be great, say, I want to be great. I want, I want to be great. great. Then Jesus would say, to be great in God's eyes, be somebody who doesn't lord it over other people, doesn't be a, a, a defined an identity or title, a doer of good, but be a person who does good for other people. Be a servant to other people. To be great, serve others, not be served. Serve others, not be served. You might say, Pastor, that's common knowledge. I get it. No, we, we, we take that kind of thinking into our home. As a husband, we can think that our wife or your spouse is there to be your servant. And why should you wait on that? Why should you have to do everything? Instead, we have to pick up the... To serving, it's it, when it comes to serving, it's understanding that greatness, that serving is greatness, and greatness is seen in the servant. That is exactly what Jesus wants us to know. Greatness is in the towels and not the titles. The legacy is in the lanyard and nothing else. That God would call you to serve him and be used by him to serve others. That is the greatness. The secret is in the serving. If you would say, I want to be great. I want to have greatness on my life. I want to have a spirit of greatness on my life. I want there to be greatness that follows me. Then be a person of the towel. Be a person of the towel. Now, let me just kind of do a little bit of, I'm, I'm not Jesus here, okay? But what Jesus did is because when I've heard this, not literally like this, but anytime I've ever heard on something similar about serving others, the natural reaction and response we have as people is, ooh, Jesus said, not so among you. And we forsake all greatness. We give up greatness. And we take on the Eeyore face. Oh, you. Why don't you just add this one in there? <laughs> Whatever you have. <laughs> right? You know, we get, I can't believe I'm doing this. We get, oh, Jesus said that greatness is in service. <laughs> I'm a nobody, you know, I'm just happy to be here. That is not what Jesus taught. That's right. The right response to greatness and not being a lord over others is not devaluing and degrading yourself. You have to have greatness to do greatness. Jesus never said, not so among you, never be great. He never said that. Jesus is taking a wrong idea of what greatness is, and he's trying to change and redefine or properly define what greatness is. He's never saying, throw out the thinking about being a great person. He never said, don't be a great dad, don't be a great mom, don't be a great team player, don't be a great this, don't be a great doctor, don't be a great counselor, don't be a great teacher, don't be a great... He never said not to be great, he said redefine, I want you to understand what real greatness is. Greatness is taking the title and applying the towel to it. Absolutely incredible. Listen, you might say, well, I don't know about that. Listen, I want to make a bold statement. Jesus has called you to be great. God has called you to be great. You have greatness on your life. You can't just, greatness is a quality. Greatness is, a, is an identifier. Somebody who has greatness, you can't tell them not to be great. They just have to do it. It's like telling the mom not to love her child, not to serve her kids, not to serve her family. Telling the dad not to work hard, nine to five, and get back and provide for them. It's like telling the family not to be what they are. Greatness is who you 
And that is even uncomfortable to say that because of our cultural understanding of what greatness is. It feels icky. It feels self-promoting. It feels self-serving. Ooh, ooh, I'm, I'm called great. Don't don't think so much of yourself. That's not what greatness is. It's more like ooh.
Psalm 71, 21 and 22. May you increase my greatness, the psalmist says. And turn to my comfort, turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a heart, even your truth, even your truth, O oh my God. To you I will sing praises with a lyre, O holy one of Israel. The psalmist is literally saying, God, make me great. Bring me back to greatness. For the purposes of God. Listen, greatness, greatness is a blessing, great. The Bible said, God told uh, Abraham, I'll bless you to make you a blessing. I'll bless you, that's greatness, to make you a blessing, to make others great as well. Listen, God has called you to greatness. You can't shrug off greatness, you can't shake greatness off. If you devalue yourself, or you kind of treat yourself like you have nothing that God use, can use you for, or like you couldn't bring anything to the table to transform somebody else, somebody else's life, you are, you are literally throwing away greatness. <laughs> you're literally throwing away greatness. Not Don't live in false humility. Don't walk around like you're beating yourself up. Well, you know, it's funny how we, pe oftentimes people will come to Jesus and they turn from sin, but they also turn from the talent. Right? What they do? You know, well, I once was a gambler. I could read cards really well. I was just so good at probability. But then Jesus delivered me of gambling and sin, and so I don't do anything like that anymore. Really? Well, walk away from sin, but how about getting on a team and offering your, your wisdom of how you see things strategically going out? <laughs> let, let God redeem the talent. Let God redeem that for his kingdom. Let him use it for greatness. Don't be ashamed when you can sing really well. Don't be ashamed when you can talk really well. Don't be ashamed when you can do hard things that other things that people find really hard, you find really easy. That's greatness on your life. That's God's greatness in your life. Listen, Jesus is our example of that. He's our example. In fact, 1 Chronicles 29, 11 says this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory. Somebody say greatness. Greatness. Wow. The greatness is his. The victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Jesus is the king of greatness. He's the greatest of all time. He's the goat. <laughs> he is. But he's our example. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I believe we have it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Listen to what it says to us, teaching us about this idea of greatness through the lens of serving others. Listen to what he says. Listen to what Philippians 2 says. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, get on the same page, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, or he's saying humility, right? Thinking humble. Okay? In humility of mind, let each esteem others better than yourself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's the exhortation Paul gives to the church. But here's what he says now. Let this mind, mindset, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't send his mommy and ask him to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus knew he was. So the literal example Paul lays out for us is, hey, don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Have humble thinking. But look to Jesus. He was great. Jesus is taking all this greatness, and he's directing it into the right thinking. That greatness, my friends, is in the towel. Greatness is in the towel. Greatness is in the serving. 
greatness is about serving others. Jesus was our example. And the Bible says about him that his fame spread throughout all the earth. Jesus would heal somebody, immediately somebody had to go tell someone. Jesus would love others. When other people were condemning certain people, Jesus would come alongside. He'd get down in the dirt with them. He'd lift them back up. He would show them how to live different. And he got right there with them. The greatness is in the serving. Listen, I want to challenge you to be a person of greatness. Todd, there's a box right in there with white towels. Could you bring them out? I want to challenge you to be a person of greatness. Don't think, oh, I can't be great. I can't, I can't make a name for myself. I can't be a person who's really respected. Yes, you can, but not for the wrong reason. Be a person who says, man, that person always has a towel when I need it. Be a person who says, I have a towel when you need it. Be that person. Serve others in that way. Jesus said, not so among you. If you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be great in the kingdom, then you must be a servant of others. If you want to be great in the kingdom, Jesus said, you don't lord it over people. You don't side skirt and avoid being a servant of others. Instead, you take the towel and you clean up the messes. You take the towel and you like people. You take the towel and you care for them. You serve them. You help them. Galatians 6, 9 says this. Let us not grow weary while, while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. Should you come on up to the platform? I want to challenge you this morning. What does that look like? What does that great, greatness look like for you? Serving. It could be, it, listen, it could be for you as a parent just making that meal one more time. It could be for you as a parent doing the pickup and the drop off at school or at work or, or the daycare or whatever that may be. Just one more time. You are not just doing something, you're serving your family. You know, I watch my wife all the time, and I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm blown away. I'm blown away at the greatness of my wife when I see her and how she serves others and serves the family, and I'm just blown away by it. I'm like, that is greatness. That is greatness. Greatness is dad taking a moment. You might end up being late to work, but it's Tommy who listens to your son and gives you some time. Greatness, mom, is it's, it's, it's not having to get from there to here to here to there.
been held in your hand. 